hot hatches reached their peak popularity in the 1980s. And today we've come to Silverstone to bring together three prime examples of the breed. Starting with the Mark I Golf GTI, the genesis of the hot hatches as it came out in 1976. We've got arguably the most iconic, the Mark III Ford Escort XR3i. And we've got the MG Maestro here in 1.6 guys, the S series engine, I've been told to remind everyone. But which one of these is best? Well, we're gonna find out. Safe to say, I grew up in a bit of a Ford family. My mum had Escorts, my father had two Mark III's and then went on to a Ford Orion and a Ford Sierra. I've always had a soft spot for blue ovals. The Escort XR3i really represents that sort of pinnacle of 80s dominance for Ford. They were best sellers for so many years. First of all, with the Cortina in the first couple of years of the 80s. And then when the Cortina was replaced by the Sierra in 82, the Escort, by then in its Mark III guys, occupied the number one spot on the best sellers list in the UK, and it stayed there pretty much for the rest of the 80s. The other thing that started to happen was that people started to shun the traditional British sports car as epitomized by the likes of the MGB, and instead their preference was for hot hatches like this, the XR3i. They were sporting, desirable cars that you could quite easily go to the shops and back, go to work and back, and also go for a thrill-seeking drive at the weekend if you wanted to. It had none of the compromises of a sports coupe or a convertible. So their popularity was inevitable, I suppose. So if we focus on the XR3i that we've got here then, this is a 1984 model. The fuel-injected car came out in 1982. It's got 105 horsepower compared to the car Bretta fed 95 horsepower. And what Ford did particularly well with the XR3i was they just built a package that was so perfectly pitched for what the market wanted. It wasn't overpriced, it wasn't over spec it had just about the right amount of equipment. And of course they backed it up with fantastic marketing and a dealer network that sprawled the UK. The thing the XR3i should be known for, of course, is great driving dynamics. And I've got to be honest, I think that's where the XR3i for me is a bit of a disappointment. The ride is crashy and pretty unrefined and the handling is not that great either. It's, it's quite taut, it's quite composed through a corner, but it doesn't feel very agile or sort of lightweight. It feels, if anything, slightly leaden. The non-power assisted steering is heavy and not particularly precise. The brakes are effective enough, but they've got quite a dead pedal feel. And the gear change is a bit spongy. The CVH engine, which debuted in the Mark III Escort, isn't even necessarily a great powertrain, if you're honest. It's not particularly refined, it's not particularly powerful. It's just okay, you know. The XR3 was probably reasonably competitive when it came out, but certainly by the time the mid to late 80s were there, there was so much better opposition out there. Anything from like the 309 GTI, by then the Golf Mark II GTI had really sort of pushed the game forward if you wanted a, you know, a high quality hot hatchback. And the Escort dynamically was left standing really. And yet I still really love it. People fondly remember these hot hatch Fords of the 80s. They were ubiquitous back in the day, but now they're rare. I grew up watching uh, iconic TV shows like Dempsey and Matepiece, where Harriet Matepiece drove a Escort Cabriolet. And that really sort of cemented the Mark III Escort in my eyes as one of these sort of iconic cars of its generation. We remember them fondly from our childhood and therefore we forgive the XR3i's dynamic shortcomings. There's a lot to criticise about an, an Escort XR3i, but there's also a lot to love about it too. Just like a Golf. Elsewhere on Classics World you'll see a video of me driving our red XR3i, the same car we've got here today, and saying how much fun it is. And it is fun and I'll stand by that, it's a fun car, it's quick enough to be fun. But when you drive the Golf you realise just how much better the original GTI is than any of its competitors or imitators. 
and that includes the XR3i and, of course, the MG, naturally. It's taken me about 30 years to get myself behind the wheel of a really nice Mark 1 GTI. <laughs> I grew up with VWs, and back in the day, I was working on a VW magazine, my first job. I sold my Beetle, needed something more practical, and I thought, well, I know what I want, a Mark 1 GTI. Couldn't find a nice one, no matter how much money I wanted to spend. Fast forward to today, I don't think I can afford a nice one. The amazing thing is, this car is the same age as the others that we're testing today. It feels so much more modern than, than the Escort and the Maestro as well. The Escort feels wooden in the steering and wooden in the handling and wooden, to be honest, in its power delivery compared to this car. It's great, it's, it's so lively and before you know it, you're speeding just like you were in the old days in a GTI. Being an 84 car, this is one of the later Mark 1s, which means, of course, it's got the 1800 engine, which came in in 81. And it's really where it scores over the Maestro and the Escort, is that extra 200cc. It just gives it a little bit more punch, it's certainly at lower engine speeds, it's got the pull whereas the others you have to drop down a gear. But the car like this, the late Mark 1, is actually quite different, although it might look identical to the earliest GTIs that came out. The 1976 GTI had a four-speed box, and 1600 engine, it didn't have the multi-function trip computer, but the recipe was all there, and in many ways wheel drive just the same, and it obviously just showed that there was a market for that kind of car, which everybody copied. Of course, the Golf uses the chassis layout that came to be the basic default template for all European hatchbacks. Front wheel drive, McPherson struts, dead beam torsion, twist beam rear axle. But it managed to do uh, such a great job with such a basic recipe. When Austin Rover were developing the Maestro, they actually used a VW Golf rear axle for their prototypes because it was cheaper to buy a VW part than it was to develop their own prototype part. They also used the VW gearbox, as we know. It's amazing how modern this car feels. It's, what, 36 years old? And apart from a little bit of wind noise and you've got the quarter lights here in the door, which mark it out as an older design, it feels so modern. It's got a great response to it, really crisp. The, a nicely set up KJTronic car it does work well. People dismiss the KJTronic as being like a toilet system or being just an old-fashioned analog system, but it works well, and that was the key to the Golf's success. I just love the way these drive. Even today, they feel like a, a brisk car, and you can just see where the attraction was back in the day, and I still want one. I just don't know. Can I afford one? Maybe if I do a bit of man maths, I might be able to. As you probably guessed, this one isn't mine. I've just borrowed it from Volkswagen UK this morning. It is utterly pristine. It's showing 45,000 miles on the clock, but it is the cleanest Mark 1 I've sat in since the Mark 1 was in showrooms. It's the quality of construction that sets it apart, really, certainly from the Escort and the Maestro. Volkswagen used a nut and bolt, where Ford would use a rivet. I've worked on that red XR3i, and everything's held in with a broken plastic clip or a rivet. And as for the Maestro, well, I mean, really. <laughs> You <laughs> shout at that thing and it'll fall apart. Here we are coming into Silverstone. What if they'd let us on track? Now that would be a race that we'd win easily. Now as the red seat belts might reveal, I'm in an MG Maestro, and I grew up with MG Maestros. My dad had one, a 1988 car, and that was a two liter EFI model. But this one is the rare S series version, the rarest MG Maestro of all, apart from the turbo, and they only made 2,762 of these between July and October 1984. But it wasn't the first MG Maestro. That came out in 1983 with the rest of the range. It could be argued that Austin Rover rather rushed the MG Maestro onto sale and it didn't have an engine for it. The S-Series wasn't ready. So instead, it took the old E-Series engine from the Maxi, resized it to 1600cc, and put a VW gearbox on the end, rather than the old gearbox underneath in the sump arrangement used by the Mini. The problem with that was, it made the bottom end weak. Crankshaft failures were not uncommon. The other problem was, being a pre-crossflow engine, put the manifold and the carb at the front of the engine, which opened the door for carb icing. Now, to make the MG version, they put twin Webers on. And because they were located right above the manifold, fuel vaporization was a problem, and hot starting became an issue. Basically, a splash and dash at the pumps, you get back in your Maestro, and it wouldn't start. The S series, as opposed to the R series, was a heavily revised design. It basically had a much stronger bottom end so that eliminated the crankshaft failure issue and it also had the intake and the exhaust manifold 
at the back of the engine towards the bulkhead rather than at the front. It wasn't perfect, the fuel vaporisation was still a problem as I found out with this car today, but it was better. The problem was that the damage was really already done. The Maestro couldn't recover its reputation until the October 1984 when the 2 litre O series engine was put in with fuel injection and that really took the Maestro from lagging behind its rivals to the head of the queue, objectively anyway. So the 1.6 car had its problems when it was new, but now it's a classic car now. And as a classic car, it's not a bad thing. I sort of think of it as akin to a twin carb, hot cammed mini. You know, it's got a choke, there's a knack to starting it when it's hot, but once it's rolling, it's great. There's no problems at all. And I'm really enjoying driving this one. I picked it up from very close to where it was built at Cowley and the lady that owns it used to work at Cowley as well. So it's got a lovely story to it. It's never been painted, never been restored, and it's a survivor. Being an earlier maestro, this one has the talking dash with the uh, synthesized voice from Nicolette McKenzie. Warning, low oil pressure. Warning, brakes require service. Warning, battery not charging. Warning, low fuel. And I love these herringbone seats. You know, I grew up with these in the 80s and it's just fun to be back in them now. Is it as good as a Golf GTI? That's debatable in 1.6 form, but it was certainly cheaper. There's something unique about this Maestro bit of character. It's not perfect, but that's why I like it, I think. Okay then, chaps, we've had a nice little drive around today. The question, of course, is which one of these three fine hot hatches would you take home? What about you, Jeff? Well, it's a funny one for me because the XR3i is the one I wanted when I was a kid. Yep. The MG Maestro is the one I grew up with because my dad had one. And the Golf GTI is the one everyone says you should buy. So you're saying you take the Golf? I say I should take the Golf, but I can't shy away my affection for the Maestro, the underdog, the cheap British underdog. Paul, what about you? I came here in the Escort. I've been driving the Golf all day. I've always wanted a Mark 1 GTI. And I've just taken the Maestro out. It's not that bad, is it? It's, am it's amazing what they managed to do. I mean, little Austin Rover were competing with the might of Volkswagen Group and the Ford Motor Company, and they still managed to do something that's sort of half decent. I mean, it hasn't aged that well, um, but then neither has the Escort, to be honest. And it that just means it's the Golf for me. I really like this car. Um, I mean, it I know it's a, a really mint example because it's VW's own heritage car and everything, but it's just, it's so much the better car out of all three of them. A bit like Jeff, I kind of grew up always wanting one of these. I had always a soft spot for Maestros. I think it was the talking car thing that I really liked. It was the, the British Knight Rider or something, but I was pleasantly surprised by the MG Maestro. It wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. Actually, for me, it's probably the one I would take home a bit like you. I'm a sucker for the underdog, so I think I would take that one home. But the Golf is just by far and away the, the better choice. And, and the Escort is just, I do like an Escort, but I just think the problem is with XR3i's sort of now in particular for the amount you have to pay to get one. I, I think dynamically it's not competent enough. Well, if you want to actually own one, this is the easiest car to own. You can get parts for these. You can't get trim parts for these. And I shouldn't think you can get a single well, thing for that, can you? An S-Series MG Maestro is a bit of a unicorn. I mean, as I was saying previously, I, I couldn't recommend you owned one when they were new. Um, the O-Series 2-litre EFI is a better car. But now for curiosity value, I would say any MG Maestro now is going to be rarer than an XR3i and certainly rarer than a Golf GTI. And what about values? Are they all, is the Maestro again the cheaper of the three? To, to buy today, I mean. Difficult to say. Uh, we, I saw one at auction just last weekend, two to four thousand reserve, sold for six, seven fifty. So you know, more strong, than three it? times its lower reserve. Uh, and a turbo would be fifteen thousand pounds. So very difficult to price because there's so few on the market. And the Golf would be what? Well, this, 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 one would be, this one would be well over 10, wouldn't it? But yeah, that nice one's 8, 8 to 12, yeah. And the same with the Escort. The Escort's about... So actually, value-wise, they're probably all roughly the same. The Maestro's probably the cheapest. So, Paul, you're taking the Golf home. I don't know, I, I, I'm still a sucker for the underdog, so for me, I would probably still take the MG Maestro. Yeah, but, I, think, um, I think I'm with you on that one. But the, but the Golf is the better car, end of story, really. So, um, yeah. So there we go. I don't know about you, but you you know, be welcome to comment on the uh, feed below about what you think about these three cars. There's probably a, a fourth or a fifth car we've not included. Maybe the Astra GTE, Renault 11 Turbo, 205 GTI, of course. That's, uh, that's our decision. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching.
can't believe that pair have just concluded a hot match video recommending that people buy my strike.